Welcome, everyone. My name is Natalie Bonasconi from IISD, and I will moderate uh, today's webinar. Today, we will discuss the issue of security for costs in international investment arbitration. Some of you may ask, costs for what? The issue here concerns the cost that a government incurs as it defends itself against an investor state claim. In order to ensure that it can recoup these costs in case the claim is unsuccessful, the state could ask the tribunal to require the investor bringing the claim to pay a deposit to cover the state's expected costs. We recognize this issue is quite technical, but it is an important issue for many countries. It has been raised repeatedly by governments because they face many hurdles when they wish to recover the cost. There have been several cases where tribunals have ordered investors to pay the government's cost because the tribunal found the claim unfounded or that it lacked jurisdiction. An OECD study a few years ago found that arbitration costs for defending an arbitration amounted to an average of 8 million US dollars. However, increasingly, the costs of arbitration and attorney's fees exceed this amount. Getting the investor to pay for the costs of arbitration when the claim is rejected is therefore not insignificant, especially for poorer states. However, several host states have been unable to recover these costs for several different reasons. This has led to frustration on behalf of host states and several states have now asked tribunals to order a security for costs to avoid this type of problematic situation. This problem could be addressed in treaties at a bilateral level, and many states are thinking about that. However, this issue has also been tabled in the context of the ICSID reform process, as well as in the discussions in UNCITRAL Working Group 3, where states are currently discussing ISDS or investor state dispute settlement reform. Given that both ICSID and UNCITRAL negotiations are underway and ongoing, and a deadline is approaching uh, to make submissions in the, um, into the UNCITRAL process, we thought that this was an opportune time to discuss the issue of security for costs. So we will now turn to our expert, Sarah Bruin, Sarah is an international law advisor at IISD. But before turning to Sarah, I would just like to share a few housekeeping rules. After Sarah's presentation, we will invite you to ask questions or share comments. You can do this orally by raising your hand or by writing your question or comment into the chat box. You can find both functions at the bottom of your screen. Just scroll down your mouse to the bottom of the screen and click onto the little hand or the chat box icon. So now, Sarah, I'd like to invite you to uh, begin with your presentation. And after that, we will have a uh, question and answers and also comments are welcome, especially from, from uh, countries who have uh, experience in this area. So thank you very much uh, for listening up to now. And Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to all of our attendees for being here um, with us. Um, I'll just move on to the first slide. Um, and start by looking a little bit deeper at um, why we're here today talking about security for costs. Um, so just to, to touch again on the explanation that Natalie gave in her introduction, what we're talking about today is, is an order that's made by the tribunal 
uh, which is requiring a claimant that's bringing a claim against a state to basically pay a deposit that would cover the state's expected costs in defending itself against the claim. And it can be in the form of things like a bank guarantee. And the reason why this, this relatively uh, technical, potentially uh, discrete issue has gained prominence uh, in recent years is a few different reasons. Um, firstly, there has been a shift in investment arbitration jurisprudence away from what was known as or what is still known as a pay your own way approach um, by which each of the parties cover the costs associated with their own um, legal fees and the costs of bringing the claim or defending the claim to an approach called costs follow the event which is basically meaning that the losing party is ordered to pay the costs of the winning party. So we've had a shift away from pay your own way to this system whereby costs are apportioned on the basis of the outcome of the proceedings. Um, and so now we see this uh, in the majority of cases. So that's why states are now much more interested in uh, being able to enforce costs orders because now more and more costs orders are being made. Um, the second reason is that there's a growing use of third party funding in investor state dispute settlement. So third party funding being where an investor's or a claimant rather's legal fees and costs in bringing a case are paid for by a company which takes a stake in the final award. And because that third party funder is not a party to the proceedings, they can't be made liable to pay a costs order. And so this is what is giving rise to a concern that some commentators have described as hit and run arbitration, where a third party funder can fund an unsuccessful claim against a state a state incurs costs in defending that claim, and then the funder is not on the hook to help pay the costs of the state. So that's why it's a hit and run arbitration. So these two issues are meaning that states are looking for new ways to manage the high costs to their taxpayers of defending these types of cases. And this is why we're seeing security for costs becoming an issue on a number of different agendas, including UNCITRAL and ICSID. So on to my next slide. Why is it that states are interested in security for costs? There's a number of different reasons. And again, Natalie touched on a few of these in her opening. Um, and the first is that we're seeing increasingly high costs of defending claims. So Natalie mentioned the figure from the OECD of 8 million US dollars as the average estimated cost. Um, but we're also seeing examples of countries paying much, much higher bills when they are defending ISDS cases. So just to take two known examples, um, the Philippines spent 58 million US dollars to defend two cases brought by a German investor um, and Australia spent 39 million US dollars defending a case um, brought by Philip Morris, the tobacco company. So states are facing higher and higher costs when defending claims and so they're looking at ways of ensuring that they can recoup those costs when they're successful. Um, another reason that states are interested in security for costs is to potentially filter out a claim that is more uh, speculative or marginal or that's been potentially brought by a claimant just to try and extract some settlement value uh, from a state with the thinking being that a state, um, sorry, a, a claimant rather, would not want to post security for costs for this kind of disingenuous or weak case, and they would instead choose to abandon the claim. So there's that filtering out effect. 
Um, the second is that the state might be interested in having a greater level of protection against an investor who declares bankruptcy, who leaves the jurisdiction, who um, hides assets or who's un otherwise unable to pay. Um, and here, this is where we have that real imbalance between a state and a claimant who is an investor. Declaring bankruptcy, absconding, shifting assets, these are all methods of avoiding a cost order that is available to an investor that is not available to a state. The state is permanent. And so you have these, these techniques that investors have at their disposal that states don't. And states are interested in avoiding the risks of these things happening. Um, as an example, um, Vietnam has successfully received um, costs orders in three different cases and has only been able to make a partial recovery of those costs in one case. Um, and then finally, to avoid this issue that I flagged on the previous slide about the arbitral hit and run, which is increasingly uh, a concern that states have with third party funding. So where there is a perhaps a case that is speculative or marginal um, and that where you have a third party funder supporting the bringing of that claim, but which does not commit to paying an adverse costs order against the investor if they lose. Um, so that's another reason why states have an interest in security for costs orders. So despite all of these compelling interests that states would have for seeking security for costs, it's actually quite rarely sought by states and it's only been granted in two different known cases. So on to the next slide. Before uh, we start looking at the cases uh, in which security for costs has been sought, um, I wanted to have a little bit of a look at some of the new treaty language which Natalie flagged, which states have been developing to address the issue of security for costs in their treaties. Um, so the first example of this that I wanted to flag was the um, Vietnam EU Free Trade Agreement, which has an investment chapter, and that provides that the state may, sorry, the tribunal rather, may order security for costs if there are reasonable grounds to believe that the claimant risks not being able to honour a possible decision on the costs issued against them. Um, and interestingly, the text of the, of the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement also links the issue for, uh, of third party funding with the issue of security for costs, um, requiring the tribunal to take into account whether there is third party funding in considering making a costs order. Um, so there's one example of some of the newer treaty language that's coming out around security for costs. And I'll come back to this point, but I just wanted to flag that the standard that the tribunal is being required to consider here is reasonable grounds to believe that the claimant risks not being able to pay an adverse costs order. And when we come to look at the arbitral jurisprudence on this issue, I think you'll see that there's quite a disconnect between what states are saying should be the standard, where states are placing the bar in their treaty drafting and where tribunals have been placing the bar in their arbitral jurisprudence, which we'll come to see is a much, much higher and more stringent bar and a much more difficult bar to clear for states. So that's the first uh, of the new treaty language. Uh, there's also some language around security for costs in the Iran-Slovakia uh, bilateral investment treaty and around uh, and in the EU's proposed language for the TTIP, um, which is really similar language to what we see in Vietnam EU, focusing again on the inability of the claimant to pay an adverse costs order. Um, just on to the next slide, please. The most um, detailed language that we see on security for costs comes from the 
2016, that should say, rather than 2006, the 2016 Czech Model Bilateral Investment Treaty. And here, the tribunal is required to especially consider ordering security for costs in two situations, one being that the investor will be unable to pay a reasonable part of the state's costs if ordered to do so, um, and the second being that uh, in situations where the investor has divested assets to avoid the consequences of arbitral proceedings. So that's um, the Czech language is really what we're seeing at the moment as being um, some of the more detailed language. Uh, however, it doesn't bring into play this issue of third party funding and how it relates to security for costs, which is what we see in the EU Vietnam example. Um, so on to the next slide, please. So despite some of the newer, more cutting edge approaches taken by states in their treaty making to security for costs, we're still seeing there's great challenges that states face in actually obtaining these orders. And there's a few different reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is the way that security for costs is addressed or perhaps not addressed under arbitral rules. And the major arbitral rules being ICSID, UNCITRAL and the ICC rules don't specifically provide an order for security for costs. They provide powers for the tribunal to, date, to take provisional measures to preserve the party's rights. And it is widely accepted that a tribunal's power um, to order security for costs is implied under this power. However, there are some tribunals which don't accept that they have that power to take uh, they have the power to order security for costs under this preliminary measures power. And so that gives them some wiggle room to decline to make that order. And the thinking here is that the right of a state to be reimbursed for its costs in the event that it is successful in defending a claim brought by a claimant is too remote a right to justify protection under the preliminary measures. It's too many ifs, uh, it's, it's too remote, and it's not a concrete right that the state holds in its hand at that given time. So there are tribunals who simply say, we don't have the power to make these orders, and so they decline to do so. There are some arbitral rules which do give express power to order for security for costs. However, they don't give any guidance on what the relevant factors are to take into account when considering making a security for costs order. And as a result, tribunals have been free to basically develop their own tests. And as we'll see when we look at the tribunal jurisprudence, the tests that they have developed tend to be very stringent, very difficult for the state to satisfy. So while we do have these treaties that are starting to provide um, for security for costs that are setting out the factors to be taken into account and which are focusing much more on the claimant's ability to pay, the jurisprudence that we do have is based on older treaties that don't have these security for cost provisions. As a result, there's been inconsistency, there's been uncertainty, and there's been, by and large, very high thresholds that have been set for security for costs orders. And that's been why, to date, states have faced great challenges in actually obtaining these orders. And we've only seen two known cases in which states have been successful. So just moving on to the next slide. And I'm going to go through quickly now some of the issues that have come out in the cases where states have sought security for costs. So the first issue is this issue that I flagged on the previous slide when looking at preliminary measures and the ability for tribunals to order preliminary measures. And that is where tribunals have simply said, 
There is no right to cost reimbursement. Therefore, the tribunal has no jurisdiction to make a preliminary order because preliminary measures, rather, the purpose of them is to protect a right of a party. And because there is no right to cost reimbursement, there is no right to be protected by the preliminary measure. So some tribunals have taken this more extreme approach of simply saying we don't even have the authority to order security for costs. So there have been cases that have fallen on those lines where the tribunal has simply declined to make that order because they said that they don't have the power to do so. Um, the next set of cases are ones in which tribunals have found that there was a right to reimbursement of costs that is capable of being protected by a preliminary measure. However, they've still declined to make an order for security for costs because they thought the, the circumstances didn't warrant it. And here, in this line of cases, tribunals have set a very high threshold for what circumstances they consider would actually necessitate a security for costs order being made. And in this line of cases, they found that there has to be, it has to be a very extreme case uh, in which a, an essential interest is risking irreparable damage um, Tribunals have described security for costs as being an extraordinary measure, which shouldn't be granted lightly, and a very rare and exceptional measure. And other cases have had tribunals refer to extreme circumstances where abuse or serious misconduct has been evidenced, or conduct that threatens the integrity of the proceedings or that amounts to bad faith. So here, tribunals have taken a very high threshold or have set a very high threshold for what circumstances would warrant them making such an order, setting the bar at exceptional or extreme. The next issue with the way tribunals have addressed security for costs is the extent to which they have taken into account or have considered to be relevant the financial standing and the ability of the, to pay of the claimant. And here is where I flagged earlier a real disconnect between what states are doing in their treaties and what tribunals are doing. And here tribunals are saying that the claimant's ability to pay is actually of limited relevance in determining whether or not to grant a request for security for costs. And there's a number of cases where when the state has raised issues of an absence of assets in the jurisdiction, the fact that the investor has used a sh shell company, um, the fact that the investor has a lack of assets and isn't able to show available economic resources, tribunals have said this is not relevant to determining security for costs. What's relevant is the existence of extreme and exceptional circumstances. However, a lack of assets, a lack of means to pay an adverse cost order is not relevant and does not constitute extreme circumstances. So again, a real departure from the way states are looking at this issue, which is that the key issue is whether or not the investor is able to pay. Tribunals are saying actually that issue is not relevant at all. Um, and then again, this issue of third-party funding. States have shown in their treaty practice, for instance, in the Vietnam EU FTA, that the existence of third-party funding is a relevant factor. However, tribunals have said, no, it's not. In cases where states have raised the, the existence of a third-party funder as being a relevant um, circumstance to take into account, tribunals have said that this is not the case, except in one case where security for, for costs was granted, which I will come to. So in one case, the tribunal stated that third party funding, which has become a common practice, does not necessarily constitute exceptional circumstances. So what 
tribunals are doing here is looking at everything through the exceptional circumstances lens or test that they have set. And they've said actually third party funding is much, is increasingly common. And as such, it's not exceptional. So it's not relevant. So this might even imply that as we see more and more third party funding, it will be less and less likely to be relevant um, as a factor in considering a security for costs order by tribunals. So this is another reason perhaps that suggests that there's a need for some intervention to, to uh, correct this line of reasoning. So there have been two known cases in which security for costs was ordered. Um, in the first case, which is RSM and St. Lucia, which is the first known case of a security for costs order actually being granted, there was a combination of factors which the tribunal considered to be exceptional enough for them to warrant making the order. And that was a combination of the claimant's proven non-history, uh, proven history of non-payment of costs orders in exit cases, its admitted lack of financial resources, and the presence of an unknown third party funder who was presumed to not be liable for an adverse costs order. And in this case, there were two out of three of the arbitrators who were convinced that this combination of circumstances was um, extreme and exceptional enough to warrant them making the order. But subsequent tribunals have distinguished this case and denied security for costs by focusing on the exceptional circumstances of the investor's previous non-payment of exit costs orders. So they focused solely on that first circumstance um, and said that if that circumstance wasn't present, then overall the circumstances would not be exceptional enough. So it seems that the jurisprudence is still saying the current financial status of the investor is still of little re relevance, while their previous non-compliance with um, previous cost orders is very persuasive. Um, the second known case in which security for costs was ordered took quite a different approach to the previous jurisprudence and said that a third party funding arrangement in which the funder has denied any liability for an adverse costs order is in and of itself an exceptional circumstance which warrants the making of a security for costs order. And here the tribunal had ordered the investor to disclose the funding agreement to the tribunal and that's how they knew that it had forsworn any liability to pay an adverse costs order. So that is a critical part of this case. Um, if there is a case where a tribunal is not willing to order this disclosure, then this type of reasoning may not be seen again. Um, and it also highlights why it's important to connect these two issues of third party funding and security for costs. So that was quite an unusual um, case. And it seems unlikely given that tribunals have not always been um, very forthcoming on the issue of requiring full disclosure of the terms of a funding agreement. Um, it seems unlikely that this type of uh, line of reasoning will, will sort of continue or pick up much speed. Um, so that's why we think that there is a need for greater treaty or arbitral rule-based guidance on this issue. So just to recap, overall, the issues that we've seen with the jurisprudence, the approach that tribunals have taken when considering security for costs orders, are firstly that they consider there's no right to reimbursement, therefore there's no ability for a tribunal to make an order to protect a right. Secondly, they've set this very high bar of exceptional or extreme circumstances, and they don't consider a financial, uh, the financial standing of the claimants and their ability to pay to be relevant. They don't consider the existence of third party funding to be relevant. And as such, they've rejected the majority of claim uh, of requests that states have made for, for security for costs orders.
So this is the status quo on the way that tribunals are addressing security for costs, which we can see is really contrasting with the way that states are addressing the issue in their own treaty banking, which is much more looking at the ability of a claimant to pay the state's costs in the event that they don't win. So on to the next slide. IASD has some ideas for elements of reform that could be brought into arbitral rules or into treaty language. And if you've had a look at the best practices paper that we circulated as a background to this uh, webinar, you'll see those um, elements of reform set out in some proposed language. But Overall, the principles that we think need to be brought in to revise language around security for costs are firstly that there needs to be a reaffirmation of the express power of the tribunal to make a security for costs order. That needs to be the first step because we've seen that relying on this implied ability to make such an order is not always successful where there is a tribunal that is looking for a reason not to make an order. The second is, the second sort of element of reform would be to set out the circumstances in which security for costs must be ordered. So here we think it's important to set out these circumstances, not simply for the tribunal's consideration or to weigh up, but situations in which there would be a trigger for security for costs. And that would be where there's a reason to believe that the investor will be unable to pay the costs of the state, where there's a reason to believe that the investor has structured the enterprise or divested their assets specifically to avoid paying an adverse costs order, or where there's a third party funding arrangement where the third party funder has not made a commitment to an adverse cost liability. So here are the circumstances that we would consider to be critical and triggering of a tribunal's um, power to order security for costs. And then finally, we think that there needs to be an element of requiring the proceedings to be terminated if a security for costs order is made and is not paid by the claimant. So here, we don't think that there should be an element of discretion, but rather uh, a mandatory requirement that the proceedings be terminated in the event that the claimant doesn't comply with the security for costs order. So when we turn to the, the questions in the discussion, we'll be really interested to hear what your thoughts are on these reform elements that we've come up with based on um, our research into this issue. Moving on to the next slide, please. I just wanted to flag that there are, there is currently ICSID's proposed language on a new rule for security for costs. And this has been published as part of the ICSID rules amendment process. And what we found when we analyzed the new proposed ICSID language against our proposed reform elements, is there are a few ways in which we think that the ICSID language is wanting. And the first issue that I wanted to flag is that the new proposed ICSID rule suggests that security for costs could be awarded against a state that is bringing a counterclaim against a claimant. And here our concern is that the whole idea of security for costs is to address an imbalance, an imbalance that is against the interests of the state. And this is what I flagged earlier on in the presentation around the fact that a state, unlike an investor, unlike a claimant, can't divest itself of assets, can't flee the jurisdiction, can't um, file for bankruptcy. So there is not so much of a need 
for investors or for claimants to be able to bring, uh, to be able to seek security for costs orders against states because states aren't going anywhere, unlike investors. So we really think that there is not a need for security for costs orders to be brought against counterclaims. And in fact, our concern would be that the state of states being able to bring counterclaims is already so tenuous and there's already so many barriers to states bringing effective counterclaims that this is really just throwing another roadblock in the way of states being able to bring counterclaims to protect public interests. We also note that in the ICSID uh, proposed language, there is no reference to third party funding um, and there are no circumstances uh, being set out that would warrant a mandatory security for costs order. And there's also not um, a requirement that the proceedings be discontinued if the security for costs order is not complied with. So just to flag, there is this proposed language out there that ICSID has, has drafted. Uh, there are some issues with it. And uh, if you're interested in more details on that, you can find our submission to the ICSID process um, on this point and on, on the other points in that amendment process. Um, and you can also, for more details of, of everything that I've just gone through in this presentation, again, look at the best practices brief on security for costs, which we published last October and which we circulated to you uh, ahead of this presentation. Um, so that brings me to the end of the presentation component of the webinar. Um, I'll just, thank you. So thank you very much all for your attention. Um, and I'll now turn over to our moderator to turn, uh, to open the floor. So thank you, Natalie. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for this uh, great overview and detailed overview of uh, this issue that we have uh, heard about from many governments uh, that we've been working with and that we've had discussions with over the past uh, years. Um, I think, uh, there are, I did not see any chats uh, que in, or questions in the chats uh, yet, but I would like to invite uh, everyone uh, who uh, is, 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 is participating in, in this webinar to feel free to intervene, to put up, uh, to, to, to request the floor uh, or to add a chat. Uh, or a question in the chat function um, at any time. Uh, just uh, let the moderator uh, know here and we will give you the floor. Um, I think in the meantime, uh, I did want to come back, Sarah, to the question uh, of the ongoing processes uh, at Ancitral and ICSID. And you gave us uh, already an insight into uh, what ICSID is proposing as a solution um, to, to the problem that governments are facing. Um, do you think that uh, using uh, the ICSID process, but also UNCITRAL, uh, are useful channels to uh, achieve change in this area? And what options do you think governments have? Sarah, uh, we can't hear you right now. Um, I'm not, oh, now we can hear you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you very much, um, Natalie, for the question. And I think it's it's really good to to focus on some of the the concrete um, ways ways forward for states to address their concerns around security for costs. Um, so I do think both the UNCITRAL and ICSID processes are really useful opportunities that states should try and harness to address this issue. I think it's I think it's a parallel process. So there's the there's the UNCITRAL ICSID arbitral rules 
um, and broader reforms processes, but there's also the um, the approach that states can adopt in the meantime, which is to address their own treaty language if they are engaged in ongoing negotiations and if they are developing new investment treaties. So leaving aside the, the treaty language question um, and focusing on the UNCITRAL and ICSID, um, I think at UNCITRAL there's, there's a clear and con concrete pathway that's available to states to address security for costs through the creation of clear rules. Um, and states have the ability to, and, and really should try and influence what goes into those rules. Um, the UNCITRAL Secretariat has, has really demarcated clear rules on security for costs with possible suspension of the proceedings for non-compliance as one of the ways to address the issue of cost and time effectiveness of ISDS proceedings. Uh, and they've given, uh, as an example of those rules, the language from the Vietnam EU FTA that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we would really encourage states to, to put themselves in a position to shape those rules on security for costs, uh, including introducing some of the key elements that, that I went through in the, the presentation, if those are things that resonate with states, such as requiring security for costs to be ordered in certain circumstances, um, highlighting the, the importance of the financial capacity of the investor, um, requiring mandatory discontinuance of proceedings. Um, so I think that there's really a, there's a clear way forward in, in UNCITRAL because UNCITRAL has said security for costs is something we want clear rules on and we're going to use that to address things like the cost of, of proceedings. So I think their states uh, can really get involved in shaping those rules uh, and should really decide what, pr what, what principles they want to see in place that can be uh, embedded in those rules. And then for the ICSID process, uh, as we've already mentioned, there is um, a draft rule that ICSID has developed on security for costs. Um, for the reasons that that I went through, we, you know, at ISD we have a position on on the, that rule, which we put forward in our submission, um, which we think, you know, the rules are really. Uh, doesn't address all of the issues that states would have in, on security for costs. So there we would encourage states to um, to argue in favour of, of amending this rule um, and, and having it reflect properly the concerns that states have. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Sarah, for that uh, explanation. And, you know, thinking through or listening to you uh, in your presentation, What's also clear is that neither the treaties nor the arbitral rules really are, are prohibiting uh, tribunals from uh, making such orders for security uh, for costs. So it's more an interpretation by the tribunals to be mm -hmm. so hesitant. And yeah. what I've been um, you know, just thinking while listening to you is that, of course, that would mean that there is not just a need for uh, an amendment or, uh, you know, having new rules and treaties, that is always possible. But uh, it would actually also be possible for treaty parties uh, to issue a binding interpretation on this issue because uh, it, it is an issue of interpretation. It's not like that there would be a need for formal amendment, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think that's that's another good approach. Uh, so I think that's something to think about. And and with respect to ICSID and and UNCITRAL, which is uh, my question, um, I I think that uh, it's interesting to see. So ICSID uh, in the ICSID review, we already have a rule proposed, um, but of course this this rule would apply only to to ICSID arbitrations. Mm -hmm. um, in UNCITRAL, the interesting element is that whatever countries achieve in UNCITRAL will apply, depending on how this is uh, ultimately uh, put into or implemented, uh, will potentially apply to all uh, arbitrations or all types of dispute settlement because 
perhaps uh, through anti-trial, we will even move away from arbitration. But um, whatever the outcome, potentially there would be a construct so that even those rules that would be adopted in anti-trial would also cover ICSID um, mm -hmm. arbitrations or ICSID procedures um, when both uh, state parties uh, to a treaty uh, submit to the new uh, ANSITRAL rules. And of course, um, this ANSITRAL issue, or this is, this is one issue that can be brought to ANSITRAL, and most likely this would be one issue within a package of new rules. Um, this is just one element that we're discussing here at this, uh, in this webinar, but it could be combined with other uh, solutions to problems that could be brought together as a set of core rules that would be adopted as a package. Uh, this is one thing that could come out of, of UNCITRAL. So I have a question here. Um, I'm just reading it uh, from the chat uh, by uh, one participant and saying, isn't it possible to realize the cost of arbitration from the dues of investors to the host state? Um, so is, that, is this question clear to you, uh, Sarah? Um, I'm not sure I, I know what's meant by the dues of the investor to the host state. So we will, in the chat, uh, get a clarification. I was also hesitating um, with respect to that, uh, to that um, element of the question. So we will continue to have uh, a, a chat with uh, our participant uh, in that respect um, and then get back to, uh, get back to you. Um, then another question I have here. Um, Sarah, could you please elaborate more on the Ancitral Secretariat's suggestion of using the EU Vietnam uh, IPA language for security for costs? More specifically, where would they suggest to put such language uh, to in a multilateral convention on invest on an investment court revised? Uh, in ANSITRAL or in arbitration rules or in the BITS? Um, not sure. I, uh, so I, I think the question is with respect to the language that's being used uh, based on the EU-Vietnam uh, treaty uh, in, the, in the exit context. And uh, I guess th th there are a lot of unknowns here. Um, if, there, if there were to be a multilateral convention on investment court, you know, where this would sit and mm -hmm. whether probably would, would it be a similar issue if we had a court rather than arbitration? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I'm not sure, to be honest, that we, as you said, Natalie, there's a lot of unknowns um, in terms of what outcomes we might see at UNCITRAL. So I think for the moment where I've seen this, this reference to the Vietnam EU language um, from the UNCITRAL Secretariat, it hasn't really gotten down to specifics of um, whether we're talking about a multilateral investment court, whether we're talking about a reform treaty. It's just really been UNCITRAL Secretari Secretariat saying, um, we need clear rules on security for costs. Uh, and then as a footnote, as an example, as the only example of text that they have given has been the draft, uh, has been, well, the then draft Vietnam EU language. Um, so to my knowledge, and Natalie, you, you may know better than me, um, but to my knowledge, they haven't gotten down to the detailed level of where such language would, would find itself. Um, they're just really looking at what the rules would be, um, what the principles would be for security for costs, um, but not sort of what format that would take. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. Um, right now, uh, up to now in this process, the members of UNCITRAL and the observer states as well 
have talked about the challenges and the concerns they, are, they have with respect to investor state dispute settlement and are now in the phase that they're trying to find solution to, solutions to some of the problems that they are facing. So one would be in terms of the content. So the, the members have to agree on the content, how to address a concern, how to find what, what is the solution to the concern in terms of content. And here, uh, as you have done, IISD has, has a view on what could be done to address this problem that uh, countries are facing, host states are facing. Um, but uh, we didn't discuss in this webinar the form that this would take. So as you, Sarah, mentioned, uh, you mentioned a few times, you know, these are things that can be done in your treaties, um, in future treaties um, that you're negotiating, or if you're in process of renegotiating treaties, you could bring in these new elements. I mentioned then that another possibility, if countries don't want to open a treaty or terminate and renegotiate, uh, then you could also come together as state parties and issue a, jo a joint interpretation uh, on this issue, which is more an interpretation issue than an, a formal amendment. Um, then, in terms of coming back to the question on uh, Ancitral in particular, uh, as I said, the the way these solutions will be put into practice is still unknown. But what is imaginable is that you identify a, a set of concerns and solutions to these concerns, uh, amongst them this, this issue of security for costs. Then that package would be agreed upon by the members of UNCITRAL and then the commission, or it would be the, the working group would make a, make a recommendation to the commission, which would then adopt uh, this set of rules, perhaps in form of a treaty. And that set of rules could then potentially uh, be structured in a way that it would amend uh, existing treaties. The way we know from the so-called transparency or the Mauritius Convention on UNCITRAL rules. So they, if you have two member states signing onto that treaty, the package of rules could then retroactively amend all the treaties that have been signed between signing parties. So that's, that's I think, what some countries are thinking about. Now, if we have an investment court, maybe this package of rules could also apply for any new type of dispute settlement, which might be not arbitration the way we know it, but which may be more of a judicial process on a, a court or otherwise. And this package could then be integrated with that uh, new institutional framework as well, because security for costs would be an issue also for governments facing claims in a court, it wouldn't be that different. Um, maybe there would be less reason for, you know, countries, maybe investors would, would uh, not use the system as much uh, in a speculative way. So maybe there would be less claims under a court, uh, but in principle, the issue remains the same and, and the solution would be the same for a court as it would be for uh, arbitration. And uh, I think the, the participant also asked, you know, would this uh, mean that you're revising UNCITRAL arbitration rules? That's not what, what the UNCITRAL Work Group 3 is doing right now. They're not thinking about amending the arbitration rules, but they're thinking about the new rules cert sort of complementing all arbitration rules, whether it's UNCITRAL arbitration or, or ICSID or ICC, they, the, this set of rules would complement and trump those um, existing arbitration rules. That was a very long addition. Um, I think those were the two. I, I do want to come back quickly to the participants' question uh, saying, is it not possible to realize cost of arbitration from the dues of investors to the host state? Um, we have not heard back on the question of what 
what is meant by Jews, but I think what could be meant is that, you know, the, um, the host state um, may have other uh, rights uh, in relation to the investment um, and that these things could be somehow um, thought about uh, in that in um, in that context. I just have a note here that uh, the participant has just raised his hand to speak. So <laughs> instead of trying to uh, interpret something uh, that isn't correct, I'd like to give him the floor. We have a few minutes left and before closing. Thank you. You're, you're, you may speak, uh, you're uh, unmuted. Hello, uh, good afternoon from Bangladesh. This is Aminur speaking. Can you hear me, please? We can hear you. Sorry. Sorry, Aminur. <laughs> we can hear uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, I made the question. I say that in the case of uh, ISDS, actually, uh, the, um, in most of the cases, claimant is the investors. And investors have some dues, that is, uh, some claims uh, from the host state. I wanted to say that if the party uh, claimant fails uh, in the arbitration arbitration then is it possible to realize uh, uh, from the for the host country to get this uh, cost from the uh, due that is available that is uh, dues from the host country that is his claim from his claim it is is it possible to realize uh, from his claim investors claim Right. Uh, I think um, just one one clarification. I, I, so usually the the this issue becomes relevant when the investor loses the. the yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So Got so it. there's nothing. So that is part of the problem um, in, in this case because if if the if the investor wins, then uh, you know probably then the state the government would have to possibly. Uh, carry the cost of the investor, uh, investor exactly. fee. So, so that's why um, we're not sure uh, how uh, how we would address this issue in, in this circumstance. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry about that. We can we can mm -hmm. take this offline as well and and okay. talk about it in more detail. Um, okay, okay. And I have yeah. one more question. I I'm. Unfortunately, we're just at the hour, and uh, I would like to follow up with uh, this uh, on this issue that just came in, um, maybe offline. I'm sorry to do this, yeah. but um, we have um, come to the end of our webinar, and uh, like I said, we're happy to follow up with some of the participants offline and discuss the questions and uh, the concerns yeah. and issues that you raised. So we will be in touch. Um, okay, thank for, you very much. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Uh, this webinar will be made um, public so that others can listen in, uh, in in the future. So thank you very much, and have a great day or a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.